In this video we're going to continue to study gravity and specifically we'll be looking at Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Let's look at Kepler's first of his three laws. The first law states that the path of each planet about the Sun is an ellipse with the Sun at one of the two foci. Now let me remind you how you draw an ellipse. The way to draw an ellipse is if you take a piece of string and connect each end of the string to a pin that's separated by some distance and then take your pen and stretch the string out and then move your pen back and forth that will draw an ellipse. Another way of saying that is if I look at this distance L1 and this distance L2 for an ellipse L1 plus L2 is constant. Kepler was able to figure out that the planets travel in elliptical orbits about the Sun by looking at data that had been accumulated for many years about the position of the planets in the night sky. This is really impressive to me that he was able to figure this out because one of the things that I find is when you see pictures of planetary orbits like the one I've provided here, it looks like the orbit is quite elliptical. In reality though, when we look at the orbit of the Earth, for example, it's really not very elliptical. Um, if we drew the orbit of the Earth to a scale where we had the diameter of, of the uh, Earth being a meter, well, it turns out that the Sun would only be outside of the center by about two centimeters. So in other words, it's not very elliptical. And that's true of many of the planets, certainly that were visible in Kepler's time. Uh, the planet closest to the Sun, Mercury, has the greatest eccentricity of the five planets that Kepler knew of. Kepler's second law says that each planet moves so that an imaginary line drawn from the Sun to the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal periods of time. So in other words, as our planet goes from position 1 to position 2, the area swept out by its orbit will be the same as when it goes from th position 3 to position 4 if that took the same amount of time. Now obviously when the planet is farther away from the Sun, that means that the planet has to be moving more slowly than when it's closer to the Sun. Again, he was able to figure this out just by observations of the planets in the night sky over many years. Now, again, Kepler didn't understand why these laws worked, but he just found that they fit the data. Later on in this course, we'll talk about conservation of angular momentum. And we'll see that once we understand the concept of conservation of angular momentum, we can better understand where Kepler's second law comes from. Kepler's third law has to do with the distance that a planet is from the Sun and how long it takes the planet to go once around its orbit. Kepler found that the ratio of the squares of the periods of any two planets revolving about the Sun is equal to the ratio of the cubes of their semi-major axes. Now, the semi-major axis for an ellipse is the distance along the longer line of the ellipse. So in other words, here are the foci. And it's half that distance. That's the semi-major axis. The key thing for us, because we're really going to deal with circular orbits for the rest of our discussion, the semi-major axis corresponds to the radius of for a circular orbit. So when we look at what Kep Kepler found, um, I imagine you know he had to try a whole bunch of different combinations before he found something that worked. But if we take 
what he did and rewrite it. What's interesting is that if you take the period squared of a planet's orbit and divide by its radius, the orbit radius cubed, you always get the same number for every planet. So that's really how I like to say Kepler's third law. T squared over R cubed is a constant for every planet that orbits the Sun. Now, again, Kepler didn't have any idea why these laws were true. But when Newton came along, he was able to derive Kepler's third law. And we're going to do it for the special case of circular orbits. Okay, so how do we derive Kepler's third law? Well, we know that the reason that a planet stays in orbit about the Sun is because the force of gravity is acting on the planet. I'm going to just call this planet M1 and the distance from the Sun I'll call R1. So there's our planet, it's orbiting the Sun. We know that Newton's second law has to apply. We're assuming that the planet is going in a circle and therefore this is a case of uniform circular motion where the acceleration is V squared over R. And therefore we can quickly go from F net equals MA to the next line where we've now put in the force that the Sun is exerting on the planet due to the force of gravity and then MV squared over R. What we notice is that the mass of the planet goes away. Also we can get rid of R1 here with the square there. Therefore we've got G mass of the Sun over R1 but now I want to rewrite the velocity in terms of the period. Remember that for uniform circular motion, the velocity is equal to the circumference of the orbit divided by the period. So the distance, it goes around in one revolution divided by how much time it takes to go around one revolution. And so I'm going to square that when I plug it in here. I get 4 pi squared r1 squared over t1 squared. And now I'm just going to uh, rearrange this. I'm going to bring the t1 squared across and the r1 squared across. So in other words, cross multiply. And you'll notice that what I get is t1 squared over R1 cubed, bring the G the and the M to the other side, and I get 4 pi squared over G times the mass of the Sun. Now, when we look at that result, if I now simply do a different planet and put in M2 and R2, or a, yet another planet, M3 and R3, notice it's always going to come out the same. And so, we can rewrite this and just say that the period squared for any planet divided by the radius of its orbit cubed is always going to be equal to 4 pi squared over g times the mass of the Sun. And what you'll notice is we have now proven Kepler's third law by starting out with Newton's law of universal gravitation. Another interesting thing, notice that not only have we showed the t squared over r cubed is a constant, but we've shown that the constant depends on the mass of the object being orbited. And in fact, this is going to allow us to use Kepler's third law to determine the mass of the Sun. So let's do the following problem. The radius of the Earth's orbit is 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters. Using this and the period of the Earth's orbit, determine the mass of the Sun. Well, we've got Kepler's third law that t squared over r cubed is equal to 4 pi squared over g times the mass of the Sun. And what we want to do then is solve that for the mass of the Sun we can see the mass of the Sun will be 4 pi squared r cubed 
divided by g times t squared. And so we now just need to plug in our values. We've got 4 pi squared times 1.5 times 10 to the 11th, and that's cubed, divided by the gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. Now we got to put in t squared. Well, what is the period of the Earth's orbit? Well, we know it's a year. However, we can't put in the period in years because big G has units of seconds buried in it. In other words, big G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th, and that's Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. Well, the problem is that a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So in other words, seconds are buried in here. And that means that when we plug in for the period, it's got to be in seconds. So let's first figure out the number of seconds in a year. So I want to convert one year to seconds. I'm going to just use 365 days per year. Some of you might know that it's really 365.25. But um, we'll just put in 365. We've got 24 hours per day. And then we've got 3,600 seconds per hour. So hours cancels with hours, days with days, years with years. And I end up with seconds. What I get is 3.15 times 10 to the seventh seconds. And that's what I'm going to plug in. So remember that whenever you use Kepler's third law, the period has to be in seconds. OK, 3.15 times 10 to the 7th, and that's squared. When you calculate that, what you're going to find is the mass of the sun is 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. If you now look in your textbook or Google it on the internet, you're going to find that that is the mass of the sun. Remember, that was one of our questions in our previous video. How do we know things like the mass of the sun? Well, that's how we know it, not by direct measurement, but by using Kepler's third law. Now, one of the important things to understand about Kepler's third law is that it not only applies to objects orbiting the sun, it can apply to objects orbiting any planet or star as long as we put in the mass of the thing being orbited. Let's look at this question as an example of that. A satellite in geosynchronous orbit always stays above the same point on the Earth. Determine the distance from the center of the Earth that a satellite will need to be placed to be in geosynchronous orbit. Well, first of all, let me just talk about that concept for a minute. We know that the Earth revolves on its axis or rotates on its axis once every 24 hours. So imagine that you want to put up a communication satellite so that it always stays over the same point on the Earth. Well, you would then need your satellite to also have a period of 24 hours so that it always stays over the country that you want it to. Communication satellites are usually put in geosynchronous orbit because that's exactly what we want. We want them to stay over the same point of the Earth. OK, we can use Kepler's third law to do this problem. The only thing that we have to change is that the mass in Kepler's third law is now the mass of the Earth. So remember that Kepler's third law can apply in lots of different situations, but the mass that shows up is always the mass of the object being orbited. So if we wanted to look, for example, at the moons orbiting Jupiter, then we'd put the mass of Jupiter in. All right, let's go ahead and solve this for the distance. We can see that if we solve algebraically for r, let's see, we get t squared g times the mass of the Earth divided by 4 pi squared. And notice that this is a cube, cube root, I should say. So make sure that you know how to do a cube root on your calculator. Um, you can either find that function. But remember, you can also just raise 
to the one-third power and that's another way to take a cube root. Okay, so let's plug in the values. We'll take the cube root of the period. So we want um, 24 hours. Notice though that it's got to be in seconds. So I'm going to do 24 hours times 3,600 seconds per hour. And you could do that as a separate step if you wanted to. We got to make sure we square that. Then I've got big G, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. I've got the mass of the Earth, which is 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. And then I've got to divide that by 4 pi squared. When you calculate that, what you should end up with is that R is equal to 4.23 times 10 to the seventh meters. So that is the distance from the center of the Earth that you need to place a satellite if, it, if you want it to be in geosynchronous orbit. Okay, that's gonna be it for our coverage of Kepler's laws. In our next video, we'll talk about gravitational potential energy and gravitational fields. So again, remember that Kepler's third law can be used anytime we have a central object being orbited. The main thing we have to remember is to put in the mass of the thing that's being orbited. So if we're talking about objects orbiting the Earth, it's the mass of the Earth. If we're talking about planets orbiting the Sun, it's the mass of the Sun.